Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible, Bible Talk. Talk. So on behalf of Alice and myself and our brothers and sisters here, we want to greet hi. you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We're glad that you can join us again. It's a blessing. Hi, it's... It's nicer to be face to face. Yes. But we appreciate the fact that, that we are living in an age when we can reach out to the world from wherever we are. That's a, that's a blessing. So we use the tools that are available to share the love and the Word of God. Amen. And I remember when the Internet first came out, you said that God created the Internet for His Word to be proclaimed. Yes, amen. And that's so what we it's will use it. So and we will use it. So, yeah. so we're continuing on. Uh, we started recently, a week or so ago, from our search of Christianity, looking at the evidence of a redeemed life, because we need to search for Christianity in our own lives Amen. before we look elsewhere. Right. We need to make sure that we take the log out of our eyes before we look for the speck in our brother's eye. Um, and and that's, that is a scriptural thing for us to do. The Word says over and over that we are to examine ourselves. ourselves. I was thinking about that yesterday when you were talking about it. I think that's the only time that we should be doing a selfie. A selfie, yeah. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. That was cute. All right, so before we start, and we're going to be picking up, we're, we're looking at the fruit of the Holy Spirit, because certainly, you know, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you'll know them by their, their fruits. fruits. But we should know us by our fruits. Yes. That's the test of our walk with the Lord. And we started in our last session looking at the very first fruit of the Spirit, mm -hmm. the foundational fruit that everything else is built upon, and that's love. So that's what we're going to pick up again today. But before we do that, I'm going to ask my sweet patootie over here, Alice, if you'll ask God's blessing on our I'll time together. You. Yes, I will. Father, we come before you with praise and thanksgiving yes. in our hearts. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity for us to share your word. And Lord, we thank you for the brothers and sisters that you've had us meet, the new brothers Amen. and sisters. And Lord, we just know that your word goes forth and accomplishes what you want it to do. So Father, prepare those hearts to receive it and change those lives. We just pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Ours too. Ours change too. our lives. Change our yes. hearts, Lord God. His word is here to change Amen. us. Amen. So we were talking, as I said, we were talking about love. <clears throat> What a wonderful thing to talk about, eh? Mm -hmm. And we left off in that last part. We were talking about there's love, and then there is love. <laughs> there is the love of God which is supposed to fill our hearts. Mm -hmm. You know, when the Apostle Paul says we have this treasure in earthen vessels, writing to the church at Corinth, right. he was talking to think about what <clears throat> the treasure is. Well, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So within this earthen vessel, the Holy Spirit dwells. Mm -hmm. But not only that, because the Holy Spirit has poured out the love of God into our hearts, and the Word of God has been written on the tablets of our heart. Yes. So that's the treasure that we bear, mm -hmm. is the love of God, the Word of God, and the presence of God. From whom much has been given, much is, much required. is required. Yes. I don't believe there's much more that you could be given. So we are responsible for those things, and it's important for us to look at it. But when I said there's love and there's love, well, the world has a form of love. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The world has a form of wisdom. Yes. You know, James wrote and said, well, there's, there's wisdom that is earthly, natural, and demonic, but then there is wisdom from above. Mm -hmm. Well, in the same fashion, there is love that the world has and understands, and then there is the love of God. And I promise you, they are very, very Opposite. different things. Yes. They are very different things. <clears throat> and I mentioned the fact that the Apostle Paul, in his letter to Timothy, his second letter to Timothy, he talks about love, how love will increase. And, and, you know, Jesus mentions this too in Matthew 24. But the love that will increase in the perilous last days in the world is a love of self, a love of money, a love of pleasure. In other words, it's all self-serving. Yes. The world's love is typically self-serving. Self it's mm. selfish. That's yes. the right word. Yes. Yeah. It's a love that's about getting. Not about giving. It's about self-gratification. God's love is the gateway to all of the fruit, mm -hmm. to all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Without His love, all of our love, in all of its manifestations, mm -hmm. will be about what we can get out of that relationship. Yes, yeah. I mean, we do things that we call love, but we do it self-seeking. Mm -hmm. So, the generally unpreached, an unpracticed gospel of our Western self-centered culture 
should be made obvious by this simple proclamation of the Lord Jesus. In the Gospel of Luke, I'm reading from chapter 9, verse 23 on. And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Self-denial not self-gratification and self-satisfaction. So we need to understand God's love. Mm. Simple enough to say. God has shown us love, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's Romans 5.8. That is the demonstration of God's love. John, the Apostle John, defines love. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. 1 John 3.16. Not a coincidence. 3.16, 3.16, eh? Mm -hmm. So God demonstrates love. John explains the love, or defines the love, but the Apostle Paul is the one who explains love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I pray you know this. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Amen. But if there are gifts of the prof of prophecy, they'll be done away with. If there are tongues, they'll, be, they'll cease. If there is knowledge, it'll be done away with. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8. Love never fails. Amen. The love that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit is not our own love that's been improved. It's not our own love that's been cleaned up. The love that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit is God's love in us. So you can't boast in the love you have. No. If any man boasts, let him boast in the Lord. It is God working through us. And hope does not disappoint, Paul wrote to the Romans, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Romans 5.5. 5. You know, we were having a chat with some people on board, I guess yesterday or the day before, and it was an unsaved fellow, and, and he started talking about, I think it was a Jewish couple from Brooklyn, wasn't mm -hmm. it? They were talking about how in this day and age, they're seeing such a lack of character, character. Yeah. in young people. And I said, well, certainly. I mean, there's a, there's a good worldly understanding of this. Here in Romans 5.5, 5, it goes on to say that there's a process. If we, if we rejoice, exult in our tribulations, that leads to perseverance. You know, it goes on. In perseverance, it leads to proven character. And that leads to hope, and hope does not disappoint. But the fact of the matter is, after the Second World War, now I'm a child, of this, I'm a war baby, I was born during the middle of the Second World War, and I know, you know, you don't have to be a great sociologist or have a doctorate in sociology to, to recognize, after the Second World War, these men and women who sacrificed so much during that war, all of a sudden, they wanted everything nice, comfortable, and easy for their children. So they took away the tribulations. Mm. They took away the discipline. And you know what winds up lacking? Character. Character. And the thing that lacks after that is hope. And we're living in a time when there is a hopeless generation. Yes. I was reading in a news article just the other day that the greatest killer mm. of teenage children in the United States of America is suicide. Terrific. The ultimate act of desperation. Yes. How can that be in the land of yes. plenty? Yeah. But it is because it's not no about hope. plenty. Yeah. It's not about stuff. It's not about things. It is about the love of God that comes through learning that process. Mm -hmm. Because God disciplines those whom he loves. If he doesn't discipline you, you're not his child. But the other thing about that, it says in Hebrews chapter 12, is that his discipline makes us partakers of his Holiness. Right. So, 
please receive this the way I give it. Don't be too easy on your children. <laughs> Don't. Because what you're doing is you're harming them. Bring them up in the ways they should go, and they'll not depart from it when they're old. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Okay, so what we're looking for now is the evidence of God's love in our life, right? Mm -hmm. So let's examine ourselves to see if God's love, the Spirit of God, mm -hmm. or if it's just our love that we have. Right. Is it His love that we have, or is it just our own love? That's the flesh. And love can be dressed up in very religious robes mm -hmm. and made to look very, very pretty, very good to others, and very good to ourselves, and not be the love of God. Okay? Paul said, the Apostle Paul said, we just read that, love does not seek its own. Right. It's not selfish. So here's an example to consider. This is from, this is Jesus from Mark chapter 8. Mm -hmm. Jesus summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So that's kind of what we just read before, but mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is, that has to be the focus of our lives. Set your mind on the things above. You know, store up your treasures in heaven. I don't, I don't know where your treasures are. I mean, you may have them in stocks and bonds. You may have them in Chase Manhattan Bank. And I don't know what's going to happen. But I'll tell you, they're all going to fail. They will. And the Word of God says in the, in the end days, you know what? Men are going to be throwing their silver and gold into the caves to the bats. That's right. Because it'll be worthless. You may think gold is the most precious thing. Well, God's storing up gold. He's using it for pavement in heaven. I mean, that's how valuable that's right. it is. So we need to examine ourselves to see if our reason for our actions is self-serving or is it selfless. Mm. You know, why are we doing what we're doing? So you can do all of the, the right things for all the wrong reasons. While actions that we do and call love may impress men mm -hmm. who look at the outward appearance, Paul wasn't fooled. Paul said, if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. 1 Corinthians 13, 3, it's a clanging symbol. So it's not the act, it's the heart. Yes. And God searches the heart. You can't take a record of your good deeds up to heaven and place them and say, hey, no. look what I did. Well, actually you can't. Yeah, you don't you, want it to. You, you can go right before Jesus on that day and say, Hey, Lord, look what I did. Look what I did. I did this in your name. I did that in your name. You don't want to do that because you'll be one of the ones who hears him say, Depart from you, evil ones. I never knew you. We have nothing to boast in but the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing that we have done, nothing that we can do, that will impress him mm -hmm. other than to trust him. Amen. We talk about the greatness, the importance of faith in our lives, and indeed it is important. But our faith is nothing more than a trust in his faithfulness. Amen. That's right. It's not about our faith, it's about his faithfulness. That's, that's important, actually. So, the Lord, who does search the heart, yes, hallelujah, he does. for his love, what's he looking for? also makes clear his position by saying, all of our good works mm -hmm. are as filthy rags. rags. Right. Isaiah 64. The word our is the key to understanding that harsh truth. Mm -hmm. Our deeds need to be the fruit of his spirit, right. the result of his love, right. his work bringing him the glory. It's all about him. him. When we start to make it about us, we are on a path you don't want to be on that path. No. You don't want to be on the wide, easy path. I'll right. tell you the truth. So, Paul goes on to say that true love does not take into account a wrong suffering. I'm going to say that a lot, right? Yes. But Matthew, Jesus said, But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. Mm -hmm. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. Right. Well, that's true love. Yes. Love doesn't take into account a wrong suffering. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Matthew 5.44. That's true love. Yes. 
If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Matthew 5, 46. I said this when we started this whole part. The Sermon on the Mount is Christianity. All the rest is commentary. This is where we find it. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Mm -mm -mm. Well, that's, that's a pretty strong word. Yes, it is. I mean, I hear Christians all the time telling me about how this person did that to them. And, and there's such division in the body of Christ that it's sickening. And trust me, it's sickening to Jesus Christ. Well, he can't get sick. You better go read about Jesus standing at the door of the church of Laodicea. Their, their actions inside yes. that church literally make him sick, sick to his stomach. stomach. That's right. Okay. I, it's, it's funny because I just did a teaching on this. A little. We do this Bible bite, like a little five, six minute teaching that we send out by mail every week. And I was talking about the fact that a number of years ago, uh, I had been teaching in London. And this woman who was ahead of a very, very large Catholic prayer group in, in England mm -hmm. came up to me one day and she said that she had just been to a seminar. She and that group had been to a seminar. And they were teaching, how do you deal with people who offend you? How do you deal with that? I mean, if you still have flesh, people, gonna get offended. you know, they're going to do things that offend you. Yeah. So she said to me, what do I do? What do you think? What do I do if somebody offends me? And I said, that's easy. Repent. And she said, oh, no, no, no. You didn't understand. I meant, what do I do if somebody offends me? I said, I understood perfectly well. If somebody offends you, repent. Because the Word of God says, Psalm 119, verse 165 says, Those who love thy law shall have great peace, and nothing shall offend them. If you take offense, it's a clear indication you don't love God's Word quite as much as you thought you did. And the other truth is this, and it's a simple truth. How many of us can say, as we are all supposed to say, for I have died and my life is hidden with Christ in God? And God in Christ. How can, you, if you die, you want to know something? Dead people can't take offense. If you don't believe me, go to a funeral home. Don't do this while it's so <laughs> Sneak in during the middle of the night and walk up to somebody in a coffin and look down and say, you are looking ugly. I never, so, and see how much offense they take. Dead people can't take offense. If we have died to ourselves in Christ, if we love the word of God and all of a sudden that offense rises up in you, the answer is simple. Repent. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to. I mean, you're your, flesh, your yeah. flesh is going to, you, you feel that sudden, oh, but you've got to take that thought captive and, to, and to, to, the to the obedience of Christ. Christ. And don't be afraid to smack yourself silly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, we have to come to that place. Because Paul says that it's a constant conflict between our flesh and our spirit. If the Spirit's going to overcome in our life, overcome that flesh, yes. we need to be tough on our flesh. That's right. I truly believe that's one of the reasons that we're supposed to fast. Yes, yeah. I mean, to it doesn't make submission. you holier. Yeah. It just, it's your spirit saying to your flesh, hey, I'm in control. Who's in control here? That's right. <laughs> Where you spend time in prayer when you don't feel like it. That's your spirit saying to your flesh, I'll show you who's in charge. Right. When you start to love your enemies and your spirit rejoices because you're doing what Jesus told you to do. Your flesh isn't going to like it one bit. So if you're being ruled by your flesh, well, repent. <laughs> you see, in an era when there's so much opposition to the true gospel, the true church, we have ample opportunity today, in this age that we live in, we have ample opportunity to practice the commands of Jesus, all from the Sermon on the Mount, the ones that I just read. Don't resist an evil person. Love your enemies. We have a lot of opportunity to do that. We're blessed. Yes. I keep telling people we are blessed to live in exciting times. We, we truly are. Yet the evidence is all too visible to me and evident to the world that we paint a very different picture as a rule. Mm. I'm going to say this, and if you have a problem with this, let me make this perfectly clear, because a lot of people have a problem with this. Get on your little computer and send an email and complain. Send the email to Jesus at heaven.org. Okay. 
Osama bin Laden, did you ever pray for him? Saddam Hussein, did you ever pray for him? Do you ever pray for Islam? Do you ever pray for ISIS? People in ISIS? Well, of course not. We don't like them at all. That's the harsh reality. I want to tell you, we would not have half the Bible we had. Had not one Christian, bold with the Spirit of God, filled with wisdom, filled with the Spirit, that one Christian had not prayed for one of the most hated people in all of Christianity in the time of Jesus Christ in there. Right. Saul of Tarsus, whose heart and desire was to persecute the church, to kill Christians, to imprison Christians. But there was a man, Stephen, in the midst of his death, his execution, he prayed a prayer, and he said, Father, don't hold this against them. I believe with all of my heart that that was a gospel of Jesus Christ that Saul of Tarsus heard that bore fruit on a road to Damascus many years later. Do you not think that God couldn't reach and touch the heart of somebody in ISIS and turn them from a Saul of Tarsus into a Paul the Apostle? How many Christians are praying that that happens? Not a lot. The unsaved, the unredeemed, don't even have the ability to do that. They don't have the power to love their enemies. It's the very thing that astounds them and causes them to search out the cause of this remarkable feat in our lives if they see it in us. They can't do that. They can't love the people that hate them. They can't love the unlovable. They can do good deeds. But again, it goes back to most of that self-serving. It makes them feel good about themselves. Maybe it's just a tax deduction. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. Love rejoices in the truth. By the way, if I talk about these people, that doesn't mean that we love their deeds. No, absolutely not. It doesn't mean that we love their actions. It means that we can get beyond that and love them. They're not doing right. Can you imagine praying for somebody that's that horrible? What do you think you were before you got saved? Amen. That's right. Well, I never committed murder. Did you ever, did you ever get angry at or somebody? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's go back to that Sermon on the Mount, true Christianity. Jesus said, you've heard it said, but I say, you, you shouldn't commit murder. I said, if you get angry without cause. Well, I never, hallelujah, I never committed adultery. Wait a minute. Jesus said, if you look at a woman with lust, you have committed adultery. We sit in our self-righteousness like little Pharisees sometimes. Say, I'm not praying for that evil person. Forgive us love. We need to examine ourselves and see if the love of God is at work in our lives. If the love of God is working through our lives, that He can use us to touch the unsaved, the unlovable, to be an encouragement to one another. Today, as long as it's still called today, encourage one another. Amen. We need to be a blessing to one another. I said we're blessed to live in exciting times. Let me tell you, they are indeed perilous times. Yes. They are indeed perilous times. And I'm going to tell you this, and I believe this with all of my heart, the greatest danger to Christians today is not ISIS. It's not a, misla- a radical Islam. The greatest danger is false preaching, false teaching that tells you, you, you know, that you, you're allowed to hate them. Yeah. More Christians will wind up in the pits of hell because they have listened to false prophets and false gospels. Yes. And they will be shocked when they hear Jesus Christ say those words, Depart from me, you evil ones. We need to pray. Thank you, Lord. We need to think about we take all these offerings to God, all these great things we're doing. The offering that God's looking for is a broken and contrite heart. That hasn't changed. That's right. That hasn't changed. A broken and contrite heart. We need to understand the amazing grace of God in our lives. We need to examine ourselves. Do you honestly think that you're you're a Christian because you deserved it? No. Really? I mean, I, I you've got to think about that. I was praying one morning. I was reading. I, I maybe I'll end on this. I just. Because it struck me like a ton of bricks. I was reading the Psalms. 
And David prayed a prayer. Now, you know that James says, the effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Mm -hmm. David was a man after God's own heart. And David prayed a prayer, an amazing prayer. He prayed, God, hide your face from my sin. Yes. He knew he was a sinner. He knew he was unworthy, but he said, hide your face from my sin. A thousand years later, sometimes you pray and you think God didn't hear you. Sometimes you pray and you think, well, God's not taking care of this. Yeah. A thousand years later, God answered the prayer of David. Yes. A thousand years later, and I thank God for that prayer of David 3,000 years ago. Because Jesus Christ hung on a cross and he said, Eloi, Eli, lama salakthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is the most incredible moment in human history. More, oh wait, more than human history. This is the most incredible moment in all of eternal history. Right. Because the great truth of God is this. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohim, Malach Halam, that's the wrong one. Yeah, no, that's right. God, hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He is God the Father. He is Jesus Christ. He is God the Holy Spirit, wrapped up into one. But for one split moment in time, God the Father turned his back on his Son, Jesus Christ. And Christ cried out in anguish that we can't begin to understand. Why have you turned? Why have you forsaken me? Because he was answering David's prayer. Turning his face. He turned his face because it was David's sin that was nailed to that cross. And God turned his face away. It was my sin that was nailed to the cross that day. Yes. That's what it says. Yes. He no longer saw my sin. He hid his face from my sin. And Alice's sin, and your sin, and your sin. We need to understand the true, amazing grace of God so that we will go out and spread the true, amazing love of God Hallelujah. that can change people's lives. Yes. Is it going to change the world? I don't believe so. This present world is reserved for destruction by fire, going to burn up. And all the stuff in it going to burn up. But hallelujah. The things of God are eternal. Are eternal. Amen. We need to reevaluate ourselves. We need to not be led by the flesh. We need to not be led by, by religion that mm -hmm. says it's all right to do these things. Yeah. There are a lot of people out there doing a lot of things that God doesn't approve of. Right. And hallelujah, I have the mind of Christ. So there are a lot of people out there doing a lot of things that I don't approve of. Mm -hmm. But that will not stand in the way of me getting on my face before God and praying for them. That's right. That they will encounter, have a radical encounter yes. with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen who is there, filled with grace, filled with love, and ready to forgive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, Father, I just thank you for that. Thank I thank you, you for that thank love you, that you've poured into our hearts, yes. that you've given us the power, the power of your Holy Spirit, to do everything that you've called us to, Lord God. That we have the power to love the unlovable, that we have the power to spread your love. Lord, use us for the glory of your name. That's my prayer. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Well, until next time, my brothers and sisters. God bless you. God bless you. Be used for the glory of His name. Amen. Goodbye. Bye. So I cherish that old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will play Yeah.